All right, well, how many of you have a routine that you like to follow, whether it's in the morning or at night? You kind of have this little system of getting ready for bed or in the morning. Yeah. Um, there's kind of a set way that we, we do things. And, you know, I get up in the morning and I go through my routine and when I'm having my cereal and then I got in the habit before I had the girls of taking this multivitamin. So I do this vitamin every morning. And there are mornings when I, I go to take it and I can't remember if I took it or not. And it, like, I can literally I could just put my glass down and I was like, did I just, I know, dude. <laughs> I'm like, I totally get why they have those um, pill boxes now. So you can put it in and then you can look and go, yeah, I know I took it. Um, but there's days where you're just tired and you're just going through the routine. You don't even know that you're doing it. And it was like, did I just take that or not? I really can't remember. So. Sometimes you just kind of get on autopilot and you're just kind of going through the motions. Um, the other day I was trying to get into my Gmail account. I've had it forever and I could not get my password right. I was like, what is the deal? And then when you start to think about it, then you really can't figure it out because you, you have to do it on autopilot. It's like if you have to really, and so I couldn't get the right combination. I could not figure it out. I had to reset my password and I was so irritated. Um, and you know, there's things in life, like uh, even John Michael was talking about how communion can become routine. It can become just like a, a ritual to us. I think the Lord's Prayer can become like that. And we're starting a new series uh, for the next five weeks on the Lord's Prayer. It's, it's something a lot of people learned as kids or in catechism classes, different things. A lot of people can recite it, but when's the last time you really thought about the meaning in the words of the Lord's Prayer? You know, it's just something we just know and we just recite it. But today and over the next few weeks, we're gonna dig in, um, kind of like opening up a treasure chest, which you can see is our, our image for the sermon series. And we're gonna dig in because there's so many gems within the Lord's Prayer in the verses that we wanna take a look at and unpack during these next few weeks. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place touch every heart and prepare us for the words that you want to speak to us god open our ears to receive your truth and may our hearts be fertile soil for your words to be planted and in jesus name amen All right well turn with me if you could to matthew chapter 6 we'll have it on the screen as well Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And we're going to take a look at what happens before we get into the Lord's Prayer and give a little context. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. We'll read the first few verses here. It says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need before you ask him. So before we even get to the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is teaching about how to pray. And that's what sparks his example to us. He's telling the disciples really that prayer needs to come from the heart. And there are people like the Pharisees, whom he referred to as hypocrites. Really, they were, they were people who were doing good for appearance sake only. And they loved to pray publicly. And it was not so they could draw closer to God. They were out there publicly because they wanted to draw attention to themselves. They wanted to, people to see how, how religious they were, um, how good they were in what they were doing. Their motives for praying were not pure, and God can't honor that. And so the praying, it really was all about them. They wanted to impress people. They wanted to look good. When in reality, they didn't have any kind of connection with God. They wouldn't know him if he was standing right in front of their face, which actually he was. And they were clueless about who he was and his character. And Jesus tells them instead to pray in private. Now that he was in, telling us that prayer should be intimate. Doesn't mean you shouldn't pray in public. There's times for corporate prayer and, and praying one-on-one -on -one with each other and in, in group settings. But you're not doing it for show or to earn credit, you know, to get a gold star. It's about you connecting with God. And he tells them, you know, you don't need to ramble on when you pray. Don't just repeat words. 
we're to be persistent in prayer, okay? There's nothing wrong in praying for something repeatedly, but when you're repeating empty words and your heart is not in it, then that is where there's a problem. I remember at North Central, one of uh, the teachers was talking about how he and his wife would pray together at bedtime. And so they'd be laying there praying, and he said one night, and he's, he's going through this list of things that he needed to pray for, and all of a sudden his wife's giggling at him. He's like, what? She said, you just asked God for a pizza. <laughs> Like, he didn't realize he was kind of drifting off as he was praying, and all of a sudden it went from this list of things to like, yeah, and I'd like a pepperoni pizza, and, and she just thought it was hilarious. But I mean, I have drifted off to sleep. The disciples drifted off to sleep when they were praying. It happens. But you need those times of really intentional prayer where you're focusing heart to heart with God, and, and you're thinking about your words. It's not just like this rote list of things that you want God to do for you. So Jesus says to pray like this, and he goes into the Lord's Prayer. And so I think probably most of you know it, so let's go ahead and try to say the Lord's Prayer together, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So we get into this context of, of the Lord's Prayer and really a, an example from Jesus of how we are to pray. And so today we're going to dig into just the first two verses of the Lord's Prayer. And so the first thing I want to point out is that prayer begins with relationship. Okay, if you look at the first verse um, found in verse 9, he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus didn't say our God in heaven or our Lord in heaven. He said our Father. And it's a very different approach. One way to me signifies going to an authority and the other signifies going to family. So let's take a look at how that differs. If you're approaching authority for something, um, I want you to think about a time when maybe you had to do that. So maybe it was going to a boss or a teacher or maybe someone at the bank, like a loan officer or something, someone in authority over you that you had to go to with a request. For me, uh, when I was in high school, I had to schedule an appointment with the principal because we wanted to start a Bible study at our school. And so I had to go to him as our authority to ask for this Bible study to be started. And to me, I felt like I was going into the lion's den. Like, <laughs> I know they say it's spelled P-A-L, principal, because he's supposed to be your pal, but I did not feel that way at the time. I felt like this fear of going into the principal's office. Um, there's different things that we struggle with when we go to an authority. Sometimes it's just plain old fear, right? What if they don't like me? What if, what if they won't listen to me? There's just this fear of like the unknown and what's going to happen. There's this uneasiness. Will this person judge me for what I'm asking? We might feel intimidated because this person has power to give us the answer yes or no of what we're looking for. So there's that intimidation. If I make him mad or if I've messed up or, or if I'm in trouble, maybe I won't get what I need. Or sometimes we create this wall, like I don't really think you know me, I don't really trust you, so I'm keeping this wall up to defend myself in this confrontation with myself and the authority. Really, there's no relationship. It's like it's strictly business. And sometimes our prayers can seem more like a business transaction. You know, we give our list of requests to God. Um, I pray for my kids each day, that God would protect them at school, that he would watch over them, that he would bless them. And that's a prayer that I pray every day. But it means something to me um, when I'm asking God. But if, if I just did that every day and that was all that my prayer consisted of, was asking God for a list of things, it would seem pretty hollow, right? Because you're missing out. It's just like this business transaction going on. So if I speak to him, if I speak to God only as authority, I'm missing out on what he truly intended. So the other approach is approaching as family. And when I think of this, I picture like a little kid and maybe he just came home from school and he, he had a really rough day 
and dad comes home and he gets a chance to just climb up onto dad's lap and, and dad can just sense that, you know, his son is struggling and so he just says, hey, did you have a rough day? And the kid just begins to, to share about, you know, kind of his tragedies and triumphs from the day. You know, yeah, dad, I was at school and we were playing baseball and I was the last one picked for the team and I was really sad about that and and then I went to get lunch, and one of the kids bumped me, and my tray fell. You know, all these things that to a kid, you know, all these things that can happen that just make them struggle in their day. But, you know, on the way home from school, I was walking, and I found a quarter, and then Tommy was able to come over and play with me outside. And it's just that heart-to-heart that -heart connection happening, right, approaching his father. There's a safety there with dad. There's a security. There's a love. There's a peace. And, you know, it can be hard for us to understand that sometimes because we live in such a broken world. And sometimes that's not the case with our fathers here. It's, unfortunately, there's a lot of hurting families and our own personal experiences can taint how we view our Heavenly Father. And I'm just going to make a plug right now for Set Free because if you do struggle with that, with seeing God as your Heavenly Father, I would encourage you to come to that workshop on March 2nd because God wants to set you free from that. He wants to heal that relationship between you and Him. And so that's a great time to come and just get some prayer for that. So God created us for relationship with Him. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Now, I'm going to read this in the Passion Translation. It says, And he chose us to be his very own, joining us to himself even before he laid the foundation of the universe. Because of his great love, he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with unstained innocence. For it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children, though our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace. For the same love he has for his beloved one, Jesus, he also has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. So before the universe even existed, God chose you. Isn't that incredible to think of? He, he knew you before the world was even here, before he even breathed life into dirt. He knew you. He had a plan for you. He chose you. He created you to be in relationship with him. And it's his, in his loving kindness, he created us with free will, with the ability to choose. Because if he didn't give us a choice to love him, that's not really love if, if it's forced upon someone. But he knew sin would enter the world, and God had a plan. Before he even needed a plan, he had it all worked out to redeem his family, to make a way for his kids to come back to him. He loved us so much, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and make a way for us to be adopted into his family. Uh, I was reading some of the footnotes in my study Bible, and it talks about how in Roman law, the adopted children had the same rights and privileges as the biological children. Even if they had been slaves, they still had the rights of the biological children if they were adopted. And in fact, the adopted child lost all rights in his old family, and he gained all the rights of a legitimate child in his new family. So he became a full heir to his new father's estate. So what does that mean to us? Before Christ, we were slaves to sin, right? So our inheritance was to be in bondage to sin. Our inheritance, our right was to death. It was to decay. It was to hopelessness, to discouragement, to despair. But because of Christ's death on the cross, we have forgiveness of sins, by his grace, we now have the rights, the inheritance to life, right? To eternal life, to freedom, to joy, to peace. We no longer have any rights to the old way, thank God. But we have all the rights to the inheritance of our new father. One of the greatest privileges is that we can approach God as our father. If we look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, it says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom 
for us who are slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So again, it's this idea of being adopted into God's family. We have the privilege of coming to him as Abba, Father. Slaves would not have the privilege of calling the head of the household by that kind of family name. It was a name that inferred affection and confidence and trust. It was saved for the kids. So we have that right to call him our father. And when we go to pray, it's with that perspective in mind, our father in heaven. We approach him as kids who've been adapted into his kingdom. And you know what? Our God, our heavenly father, he's always in a good mood. Right? He is always in a good mood. And who's his favorite? Me. <laughs> right? We all are his favorite. Right? We all are. There's no fighting for who gets to be closest, for who's number one. He has enough love, enough blessings to go around for all of us. He loves us and he wants to lavish his love on us, his gifts upon us. There's no competition. There's no fighting to be heard. There's no fear of condemnation. Just grace and love from our Heavenly Father. He gives a whole different feel to when we pray, when we, when we do it from a place of relationship and not from a place of obligation. It totally changes that time of, of communication with our Father. So prayer begins with relationship, but it's also expressed through worship. Hallowed be your name. So hallowed means respected or holy. Kind of goes back to what we read so many times in Proverbs about the fear of the Lord. It's that awe and that reverence, that respect for God. It reflects a heart that's filled with, with worship. As we are worshiping our Father in heaven, we're thinking holy is your name. We're thinking about the attributes, the characteristics of our God. When you pray, it begins with knowing you're in relationship with your heavenly father and it's an acknowledgement of who he is expressed through worship. And you know, when you think about all that God did to make a way for us to be in relationship with him, there should be a natural outflow of worship from our hearts because of who he is and all that he's done for us. We approach him out of that thankfulness and that gratitude for making that relationship possible. We reflect on who he is, we praise him for who he is. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. 1 Chronicles 16, 29. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord and the beauty of his holiness. So why worship? Why would God want us to start out in prayer reflecting on who he is? I believe because it, it changes our perspective and changes how we pray because it connects us with him. So like when I have my time of prayer at home, there's times when I am just kind of praying through different prayer requests and different needs. But when I can have that quiet time alone with God, I love to just put music on, on my phone, you know, play a favorite worship song. And I, I might spend, if I have a half hour, I might spend a big chunk of that just worshiping God. Because I find that when I get my focus on him and I worship him, problems that seem big, all of a sudden it's like, nah. Whatever, God's got it. Like, it's okay. It just completely changes your perspective because we've got a big God. Our problems really aren't so big when you look at who God is. It changes our perspective. And so that time in prayer or in worship before you go into the, your prayer requests and those different things you need, there's such communion that happens between you and God that it really changes how you pray because you're getting your focus off of your troubles and off of your problems and on to the one who can solve all of that for you. Getting your eyes on your heavenly father, on that relationship with him and his love and his grace and his mercy. The Bible also tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 22, three says, yet you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel. When we praise God, his presence just it, you can feel it. it, it sets in this place. Like during worship, when we're praising God, you can feel his presence. Uh, I was listening to a, a lesson from a, a pastor over at Bethel Church in Redding, California, and he was talking about the healing rooms that they had started. And he said at first, they would have people come in for prayer, and 
they would be talking with people about what their issue was, and, and they were seeing some miracles, but not as many as they hoped. And a lot of the volunteers were getting kind of weary from the praying and just and hearing all these different things that were going on in people's life. It's like, man, all this cancer and all this and all that. And, and they began to think, God, how, how can we kind of change our perspective with how we're doing this? And so they began to worship before the prayer time and just have this time of worship and inviting God's presence into that place. And pretty soon God's presence was so thick in the room that people would come in and they were just healed when they walked in. It's like they didn't even need to go into the prayer line. They just, boom, they were healed. I mean, how awesome is that? Because they connected with God, the healer, and he just took care of it. And all of a sudden their volunteers weren't quite so like, oh, there's all these burdens and these things, they were like, God, God just does it. And they just, it changed their perspective because they got into the presence of God. They worshiped him. And from that place of worship and God's presence being sensed, healings happened. The miraculous took place. It's a pretty incredible thing. I'd like to take a look at Revelation chapter four, which actually we kind of sang today in worship. So much of worship really helps set the table for what God wanted to share this morning, talking about uh, being in his family and, and how worship, just how worship happens in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, John is seeing a glimpse of what the throne room looks like. And it says, each of these living beings around the throne had six wings and their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. And day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. And whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, The 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Worship is continual in heaven. And as we connect more and more with God, we're going to see what's happening in heaven happen more and more here on earth. So as we worship God, we're connecting with what's happening in the throne room. God wants us to worship him, to have that be a part of our prayer life. So the Lord's Prayer, it begins with relationship, right? Our Father in heaven. It's expressed through worship. Holy is your name. And the has the goal of bringing God's kingdom to earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a book that I've been going through by Bill Johnson called When Heaven Invades Earth. And this is one of those books, you know, some you can read and you get through several pages and you'll take a note or two. I mean, like every page, it's like, oh, that's so good. Oh, that's so good. Like it takes so long to get through it because there's so many just good teachings and, and just good ways of thinking in here. Uh, So on page 59, here, let's see. So he's talking about this idea of, of God's kingdom coming. He says, this is the primary focus for all prayer. If it exists in heaven, it is to be here. Um, It is to be loosed on earth. It's the praying Christian who looses heaven's expression here. When the believer prays according to the revealed will of God, faith is specific and focused. Faith grabs hold of that reality. Enduring faith doesn't let go. Such an invasion causes the circumstances here to line up with heaven. So this idea of God's kingdom coming, of his will being done on earth as it is in heaven, is about releasing what's in heaven over life here. So if there's joy in heaven, then we want to see joy here. If there's peace, love, God's presence, freedom, those things are in heaven. God wants to release that to us here. So it's grabbing a hold of that and allowing God to release that through us. But on the flip side, if it does not exist in heaven, then we we don't want it to be here. So he goes on to say, and this is from Matthew 16, 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So notice the phrase shall have been. The implication is that we can only bind or loose what has already been bound or loosed there. So heaven is our model. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're asking God to do what he's doing in heaven, we're asking him to do it here. And he wants to accomplish that through us. So let me give you an example. He talks about his, his son who is a worship leader and he goes out to the mall with one of his friends and they just, you know, set up a stand. Emily, Jonathan, you guys could try this sometime. <laughs> Go to the Mall of America and they're just playing some worship songs, you know. And, and they're just getting into the presence of God themselves, just worshiping. And they, they're there for about three hours just singing praises to God. So they put their stuff away, and this guy comes walking through the area, and all of a sudden he, he takes out illegal drugs from his pockets, and he just drops them there by them. And they're like, I mean, can you imagine? He, he encountered the presence of God as he was walking through that place. He sensed something in the atmosphere that convicted him, and he just decided to repent. I mean, that's incredible. They, they changed the atmosphere there. They were bringing heaven to earth because there's no illegal drugs in heaven. And that guy encountered the presence of, of heaven, the presence of God, and was like, I, I don't need these. Here you go. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, the impact that praying heaven into earth can have. We were at a, a conference a couple weeks ago, some of the leadership team um, over in Rochester, and got to hear uh, a pastor called Bill, his name is Bill Vanderbush. And one of the things I wrote down that he shared was, your destiny is going to heaven. Your assignment is bringing heaven here. So your destiny is going to heaven. When you make a decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your name's written in the book of life, you're going to heaven, right? Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So there's a few different ways we can look at this, okay? You can think, I got the golden ticket, right? I'm going to heaven, and now I'm just going to do my best to fly under the radar, not do anything too bad, go from church, go to church, you know, time to time, make sure I'm still good. Um, but, whew, all right, I'm saved, it's all good. Um, or you might think, I don't want to contaminate myself, hanging out with sinners. Thank God he saved me, but I'm going to stay at church and hide out here because it's safe. People in the world are crazy. You know, my husband and I were talking in the car yesterday. It, it is a bit crazy. Like, they're approving full-term abortions. They are trying to take away the right to bear arms. There's all these racial differences. It's, it's crazy out there. But... Uh, we don't want to have the attitude of, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me and just come and get me out of this mess. You know, I'm just going to stay in the church and wait for Jesus to come. Um, you know, we could have that attitude, but that's certainly not what we want to do. So there is another option. Your destiny is going to heaven, right? That's your future. But your assignment, what God's calling you to do, is bring heaven here. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has called us to bring heaven to earth. So how? How do we do that? You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He is God in us. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And Jesus said we would do the same things that he did and even greater in John 14. Okay? So if we just even got a fraction of a grasp of what that means, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, we have God in us in us. I mean, we should be like, whoa. We get out of bed sometimes and we're like, oh, it's snowing again. I feel so defeated. <laughs> I just don't think I can get through another day. <laughs> no, we have God in us. It's going to be a good day. I don't care if another six inches come. I mean, I do. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> but we have God in us and he has a good plan for our lives. He wants to use us to change this world, right? I mean, we have the joy of the Lord in us. We can have instant access to peace from God. We don't have to live under condemnation. We don't have to live in despair. God set us free and his spirit lives in us. And it's for a purpose. He wants us to share who he is with others. And you might think, I don't want to push religion on others. You know what? Good. I don't want to either. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with our God, with our heavenly father. 
He wants us connected with him. And if we are connected with our Father, we are united with Christ, then we will act with the heart of our Father. And his heart is for the lost. Right? He leaves the 99 to go after the one because his love is reckless. It is relentless. He wants us to have that same kind of passion to go after those who don't know who God is. He wants us to go after them. Signs and wonders, bringing heaven to earth, isn't so we can sit around and go, woohoo, that was so cool, God. He wants us to take it out where we live, in the marketplace, to our families, to our, our businesses. It's our assignment to be connected with God through relationship that we walk in his presence and release the atmosphere of heaven so it impacts the world around us. So again, how do we do that? Philippians 3.20 says, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. So we live on earth, but we are citizens in heaven. Okay, think about that for a second. We're citizens in heaven, but we're here. We are ambassadors. It's our job as followers of Christ to represent heaven, where our citizenship is, to represent that in this world. So an ambassador lives in a country, but he's representing another country while he's there. So let me read to you another little excerpt from here. It says, just as ambassadors of the United States have an income based on the standard of living of this nation, regardless of what nation they serve in, so also ambassadors of the kingdom of God live according to the economy of heaven, though they are still on earth. All of our king's resources are at our disposal to carry out his will. And he even goes on to say, as an ambassador, the military of the kingdom I represent is at my disposal to help me carry out the king's orders. If as a representative of a nation, my life is threatened, all of my government's military might be, military might is prepared to do whatever necessary to protect and deliver me. So it is with the heaven's angelic hosts. They render service for those who would inherit salvation. We have all the authority of heaven backing us to represent God here on earth because God wants to release his love in our communities, in our workplaces. He wants to set people free and we have God in us to release that freedom to those around us. And we have all the backing of heaven. That means supernatural supply, right? The heavenly hosts backing us as we do our best to be ambassadors for God. So it all goes back to our Father in heaven. Holy is your name. It's a relationship with God expressed through worship. And it's growing in intimacy with God. Because that's what prayer is. It's that intimate communication with your heavenly Father. And it's being in awe of who God is and all that he's done for us. And we want to see the atmosphere of heaven released on earth. And I really think as a church, this is where we're at. We want to see people set free, not only in this place, but out in our communities, where we work. I would love the day when I can go to Walmart to get my groceries. And like the presence of God is so strong in me that, you know, this lady over here, she's picking out her cream of mushroom soup to put in her hot dish or casserole, depending on what you prefer. <laughs> and I walk by and all of a sudden she's like, oh, what was that? Like, she just got a joy bomb, you know? Like, bring out the holy hand grenade, right? <laughs> like, that we, we just bless people in the spirit. You know, you're just walking down the aisle. God, just bless that person over there. And they're like, what's that? <laughs> you know, isn't that awesome? Like, to think that we would be able to do that. And I, I long for the day where that is happening. And it's just natural. We don't even have to think about it. We're just walking by and someone's like, they feel something different. And so I want to close with, with one quick story, and then John Michael, I'll have you come up to close the service after I pray. Um, God brought this, this situation to mind from, I, don't know, I think it was last year maybe, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it, and so I just want to close with this thought. We, my husband and I were fishing out on the St. Croix River, and we'd been out for a little while, and so it's time for a bathroom break, so we pull over um, towards a, a dock, and there's some 
you know, shops or whatever kind of around. But I'm looking for a place to uh, go use the restroom, and I'm trying to look to see what's close by, and I'm like, there is not really a, a place that looks like it has a bathroom or that I want to walk into. And I see like this tattoo parlor, and it's like, <laughs> seriously like the closest place, and I'm like, sometimes your physical need outweighs your spiritual wisdom and discernment. <laughs> And I was like, I can go in there, right? Like, it's, it's no big deal. Like, the place looks a little run down, but they must have a bathroom. Maybe it's close to the door. So I walk in there, and no joke, like, I, as soon as I get in, I just feel like this oppressive, like, and I don't have a problem with tattoos. I'm not saying that at all. But when I went into this place, there was a spirit there. Um, and I walked in, and I just was like, and it's funny because a couple of people there, I think they could sense it in me because they were like looking at me like, what are you doing in here? I was like, um, just looking for the bathroom. <laughs> but I, I walk in and I just, I, I had to leave because I just felt such um, an oppressive spirit in that place. And I was like, wow, God, this is crazy. I've been in a movie theater before. Scott and I both went to the movies once um, at this particular theater. We left and we both, I was like, did you? feel weird in there? And he's like, yeah. I mean, we were seeing like a PG movie, but there was this heebie-jeebie kind of feeling when we walked in. We'd never been to this theater before, and we both had nightmares that night. It was like there was just something evil about that place. But my prayer for us as a church is that where we go, people walk by us, and they're like, whoa. They sense the love of God off of us. They sense what we bring as an atmosphere into wherever they are. And they see Jesus in us. Because it is real. You can sense those things. And some people are more sensitive to that, I think, than others. But how I felt and reacted, I want people to see Jesus in me and react like, whoa, there's something different. I want that. I need that. That's how we want to live our lives. Not that we have to be out on a street corner preaching, but just by very nature of who we are, that people around us see God in us and it transforms their lives. So God, let that be, Lord. Let it be. Father, I pray that you would so impact our lives that it would change the world around us. God, you, you have blessed us with every good gift. You are a heavenly father who loves us and cares for us. You made a way to adopt us into your family and we thank you for the relationship that we have for you. Thank you that we are adopted kids into your family and that we're all your favorite. God, that you have enough blessings to go around for each one of us. And God, we worship you as our heavenly father. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for all that you have done for us. And God, we pray for your kingdom to come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for freedom and peace and joy to be released in us, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our communities, that people would see the kingdom of God. They would sense the presence of God in our lives and it would change them. Just as I walked into a room and sensed that something was different, God, I pray that, that the darkness that we would encounter would see the light of God within us and it would change them. In Jesus' name, amen.